this place that we can call our work time of worship. Um, man, what a week it has been, and we are here just to be restored and refreshed. And so um, I want to invite you to stand, and I'm going to do a quick prayer. And then as uh, whenever I say amen, let's just enter into this time that the Lord has created for us to worship him. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus, asking you just to come and to, and to mend the brokenhearted and just to come and to minister to our souls today. Father, we desire today to worship you, to sing a new song to you, and to claim today that there is no other God to worship except you, Father. And so in that, we, uh, we thank you for your presence and what you're going to do in our time together. And everyone said amen together. Amen. Amen. We're so glad again that you're here. This is a song that we've done uh, for a while here in the Contemporary Worship Service, but it is a simple thing that says, we sing a new song unto the Lord. So it, it's exciting, and you can put together. Sing a new
In Romans 8, 31, it says this, that if God is for us, then who can be against us? And we can claim that today. And there's no power that is greater than that of our God. Amen? Amen. Let's sing this together. What are you turned into wine? What are you turned into wine? You open the eyes of the blind. There's no Yes. 
So let's bow in prayer as we begin. Father, thank you for your infinitely perfect love that you show us through Jesus. Thank you that day in and day out, you keep your word. In fact, your word says in Proverbs 35, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Be our shield. Open our hearts today, God. Um, Pray that we don't um, hear my words, but it'll be your words that are spoken. Again, your words are eternal, mine are not. We ask that um, you would help us to learn, trust, and obey you, and that all um, honor and glory would go to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is good to be back for a uh, second week, and uh, we will continue our study on how to stand strong in uh, dark days. 
how to stand strong in, um, you could say, difficult times, or how to stand strong um, when this culture is pulling us all in different directions um, away from our God. So we want to make sure that we understand what we can do. And what we started last week was, we started to, the idea was I was going to be with you for four weeks, so I have this week and two more weeks, and we're looking at Philippians. And what I started to do last week was to build a foundation. We were going to build a foundation that's based on Christian joy and then look at some essentials for Christian growth. And as we build that foundation, then we were going to build upon upon each week. So last week, just real quickly, um, we said that uh, this isn't going to be easy. It'll be difficult in some times because it's going to call us to change probably maybe the way we live help us to rely on you know, God more. It'll be uh, something that only the Holy Spirit can do is to produce this type of joy. We also said that we wanted to make sure this is something that's very practical, something that we can start putting into practice last week, this week, and the weeks to come that we can walk away with that. So we define joy. I'm gonna go back and just do a quick recap, about a five minute recap. We define joy this week, this way, in case you weren't here last week. I encourage you all, if you take notes on a note, you know, like, like a journal like my wife does, Um, Take notes. If you uh, are like me, pull your phone out, start typing notes on a tablet. Um, Or as I said last week, if you're like my friend and he just uh, remembers everything, then then open your mind up and let's hear what God has to say for us. All right, so this is the way we defined joy last week. Joy, it's a state, an attitude, a condition a Christian exhibits regardless of their circumstances, all right? And we saw that in Paul's life. Regardless of his circumstances, he had this joy. And the question is, why does that happen? It's because the Christian, his or her, okay, focus is not fixed on the situation, but on God. And this is something that can only be produced by the Holy Spirit. And so what we did last week is we looked at five characteristics of Paul's joy that the Holy Spirit uses to produce joy in our lives, all right? The first one, if you remember, was the joy of remembrance, Okay, the joy of remembering what God has done in your life, the joy of remembering what God has done in other people's life. That was number one. We saw that in actually in verse three. The next one was a joy that comes from praying for others. And what we talked about was when a Christian's life is so overwhelmed with the love of God, the Holy Spirit will produce in us a joy for praying for other people. It gets our focus off ourselves and our focus on other people. Then there was a joy that comes from the fellowship with other Christians. Paul said he was so joyful for the partnership that the Philippians had, that church. They had sent him um, financial aid. They had sent him uh, Ephroditus to to, to do for him what they couldn't do far away. And he was so joyful for their their participation in the gospel. So it was that joy that comes from fellowship. And then we talked about the joy that comes from the hope in God. And we defined hope for a Christian is different than what the world's hope is. And let me just kind of go over that real quick. So, so, so the world, I might sit there and say, I hope my sports team wins next week. And I have no idea if they're going to win or not. All right? That's not Christian hope. Christian hope is, is, is certain. It's for sure it's going to happen. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Um, he says, may the God of hope, so hope comes from God, okay, fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Believing what? trusting God's promises, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll abound in hope, all right? So our hope as Christians is different than what the world is. Our hope is something that's certain and we base upon it. And then we looked at a joy that comes from love, genuine love. Paul would say um, in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse nine, let love be genuine, all right? So it's a genuine love that comes from God. So those were the five characteristics, you could say maybe five elements that the Holy Spirit will use to produce joy in your life, okay, regardless of circumstances. You know, joy that circumstances can't take away. But we weren't naive. We know that whenever we start to study God's word and we really want to make differences in our lives, that we know our enemy, we got a battle on our hand and our enemy is going to do something. So we looked at five things, all right, that the enemy does to destroy your joy or to try to take your joy away. And number one was an inadequate understanding of God's sovereignty, okay? So if we struggle with knowing whether or not God is in control of a situation or if God's gonna keep his promises or something like that, then guess what? You're gonna struggle with joy. I'm gonna struggle with joy. The next one was not praying. Whenever we try to solve all the world's problems by ourselves without taking them to God, thinking that we can get an answer, that an answer that only God can do, well, guess what? We're gonna struggle with joy. 
The enemy also will sit there and uses materialism, and we also define this one as circumstantial orientation, basically getting your joy from outside circumstances, meaning... I don't have to work tomorrow because it's a holiday, it's Memorial Day, therefore I might be a little joy more joyful, but then come Tuesday when I have to return to work, I might be quote, quote unquote as joyful. That would be something that's circumstantial joy. And, the, and, and, and our enemy will use that, okay? And anytime we're getting our joy from outside circumstances, we're never gonna be satisfied and it's never gonna be a lasting joy. Another one, not being thankful not being thankful for what uh, God has done for us in our lives, what God has saved us for, uh, saved us for and saved us from that. And the other one is dissatisfaction with your earthly circumstances. Some people wish they were taller. Some people wish they were shorter. Some people wish they were bigger. Some people wish they were, you know, skinnier. And they spend their whole lives focusing on that. And the enemy will use that. And if you're caught up in that, it'll steal your joy. Okay? That was five minutes of what we did in 40 minutes last week, all right? Five things that the Holy Spirit uses to produce joy in your life, and then five things our enemy uses to try to steal that joy away. We need to be on the alert for those. We need to understand. We need to ask God to help us um, participate in those things that do produce joy. So today, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and we're going to look at how do we grow. What are, what are five essentials for Christian growth? And we're going to try to sit there, we'll dig into them and try to see, figure out how do we apply them. Uh, something y'all may not know about me is I'm, um, I love documentaries. I, I, I watch them all the time. I'm one of those people who does not find those boring, but I enjoy them. And I would probably say my favorite documentaries are based around World War II. And if there's not a World War II one on, then I probably will watch a nature one. And so this week, it was this past week, um, I, was, I was flipping around. I think my wife, Jane, was working on her seventh Bible study for the day. And uh, so I was uh, upstairs waiting for her to come up, and I found this documentary called The Earth at Night. I don't know if any of y'all have seen this or not, but it's amazing technology. They now have cameras, okay, that actually what they do is they start to show off, and it's nighttime, and you can barely make out things. Then they flip the cameras on, and it's almost as if you're looking at it sunlight and daylight, and it's in color. It's the Earth at Night in color. So it's not like if you've ever seen those movies, Tom Clancy movies or something like that, where, where the special forces guys are looking through the, the scopes and it's kind of green or something like that. It's not like that at all. I mean, these cameras are huge and at night, pitch black, it, it, it's actually as if you're looking daylight in color and it's amazing what's going on in the animal world. So I'm like, okay, this is right up my alley. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna love watching this and seeing what's going on. So I started looking through the episodes and there's one on lions and I thought, okay, that's gonna be cool because we're gonna get to see some lions chase some other things around and eat. And so I watched that one. And then there was one on bears. And I thought, well, I gotta watch bears, okay? And so this bears, they, 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 this one takes place in the Borealis Forest in Europe. Okay, that's the forest that's, that's way up in North America and then goes all the way over in the top parts of, uh, the parts of Europe. It's where you can see, um, you know, what are those green lights at night that, that shine? Uh, uh, Borealis, Aurora Borealis, yeah, thank you. And so what happens is they, they started with this one young bear that came out of hibernation. His name's Alvar, A-L-V-A-R. And he's about two years old and he's really weak, okay? And what happens is he's got to get food. His main focus is he's got to get food because he's got to get his strength back. Or what the narrator is saying is he's not going to live. He's going to die. So here's Alvar. He's, he's, he's a third of the weight that he was when he went into hibernation. And so he's digging in the snow and he's eating some roots or he goes over here and he gets a little thing. And, 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 and what, the, what, what the, the narrator is saying is those are just snacks, but, and, 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 and he said, but, but sadly, these snacks, if Alvar keeps doing this, he's going to die. And so things get desperate for Alvar, okay? And what happens is they turn the camera off and everything's dark, okay? Because Alvar's going to have to do something really desperate. And then they turn the cameras back on and it lights up. Alvar's in the woods and there's these two wolves that were feeding on this moose carcass. And they said, this is going to be very dangerous because Alvar, these wolves can, can take him down and kill him. So Alvar waits, get this bear. These two wolves kind of go around and he goes to his carcass, gets a little piece of meat, but one wolf turns around and comes back and starts nipping at him, slapping him around. Alvar, Alvar has to run off, right? And in any good documentary, okay, they, they start looking at why you start watching other animals and they, you know, beavers or what they do at night or, you know, this animal here or other bears. And then they, you know, come back and this, these wolves now have grown to a pack of seven, okay? And here they are feeding again. 
okay, on, on some type of animal carcass. And they turn, the, they turn the camera off, and now it's dark, and you can barely make things out and stuff like that. And then they turn the cameras back on, and there's a rustling in the woods. And out comes literally the biggest bear I have ever seen in my life on film. And it's Alvar, because they had tagged him. And over the past four or five months, he's grown three times the size he was. He was feeding on 20,000 calories a day. But there's seven wolves, and he walks out, and those wolves just scatter. Just like the wind just blows sand away, and they're gone away. And they said, the size that he was and the strength that he has, not even a pack of seven wolves. Three or four months later, one wolf just slapped him around. Now, Alvar, because he was getting the nourishment he needed, he could take on what that was, and he was going to survive. Now, why do I bring up a documentary about a bear and eating and stuff like that? Because in Christian growth, so many times as Christians, we settle for quote, spiritual snacks, you know? And when Jesus in Matthew 5 said, okay, you need a hunger and thirst for righteousness, what he was talking about is removing all those barriers in your life so you could focus on what really matters. But sadly, a lot of Christians just want a spiritual snack. What Jesus was talking about when he says hunger and thirst for righteousness, it's not a verse a day keeps the devil away. It's not, it's not listening to a podcast for five minutes in the morning when you get ready. It's not turning into your Bible and scanning through a couple of scriptures. And in fact, what Jesus was saying is, whatever obstacles are in your life, remove them so you can focus on what really matters. The author of Hebrews says it this way in chapter 12, verses one and two. After he finishes writing that great chapter on on the people in the faith, he says this in chapter 12, verse one. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, he says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin. That's interesting. You know, obviously we'd say sin, but there also must be some other encumbrances that aren't necessarily sin that take us away from God. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin that so easily entangles us and let's run this race with endurance. And then he tells us in verse two how to do that. He says, we do that by focusing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, and here's the word we've been looking at, for the joy set before him endured the cross and disregarded the shame. Now, the question is, what was the joy set before Jesus that allowed him to endure the cross and disregard the shame? Well, that was, that, that's, that's the love of the Father. You know, sometimes we think love was created. We think in Genesis 1-1 where it says, you know, in the beginning God created, all right? We think somehow love was created then, but not. That's not the case. See, love is an attribute of God. And God's eternal. God was before anything was created. So you had love of the, between the Father, love between the Father and the Son, and love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, for the joy set before him, for the, out of the eternal, infinitely perfect love he has for the Father, and the eternal, perfect plan that the Father had in place, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarded the shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And now that part right there, sitting down at the right hand throne of God, is a reference back to Old Testament times when they would do that sacrificial system. One day a year, a high priest would go in during the Day of Atonement, and he would atone for the sins of uh, the, the nation of Israel. And they would tie a rope around him, so in case he died in there, was found unworthy or just died of a heart attack or whatever, they could pull him out. Because you don't want to be the guy going in after the high priest just died. That's how serious this was. But something about it, when the high priest went in to the Holy of the Holies to make that atonement, he was never allowed to sit down. Why? Because his sacrifice was never perfect. The sacrifice of animals wasn't going to be enough. That was a picture, a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do on the cross. So when in, 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 in chapter 12, verse 2 there, where it says, he, but, you know, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, described his shame, and sat down. Jesus was saying, it's done. It's finished. It's complete. He's the infinitely perfect sacrifice, all right? So we as Christians have got to grow. And what we're gonna see here right now in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, if you'll turn there, we're gonna see Paul prays. And as he's praying for these Philippian Christians, he focuses on these essentials that they as Christians are gonna need to grow and we can glean information for that and apply that to our own lives. He's He's focusing on five elements of spiritual life that every Christian, including myself, including you, must pursue. Now I'm gonna give them to you up front. Okay, and then we'll go through each one of them. The first one's love, all right? The second one is focusing on what really matters. 
Your translation may use the word excellence. All right, the third one is integrity, and we'll look at personal and relational integrity there. The fourth one is good works, all right? And the fifth one is the glory of God. And in fact, in some ways, you could sum up the whole Christian life in those five terms, love, excellence, integrity, good works, and glory, all right? Sorry. So let's start reading this, and we will dig into this, and we will uh, see how this applies to our lives and start putting it together. Uh, verse 9. I'll read verse 9 through 11, and then we'll dig into it, okay? Um, I'm using the NLT if you want to know what translation. Um, so if you have something electronic and want to turn to that, um, here we go. Verse 9. I, I, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives into the day of Christ's return. Verse 11, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. All right, verse nine, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in the knowledge and understanding. So all Christian living, all right, begins with love. Everything in our Christian experience must be built upon the foundational love, foundation of God's love. And in fact, the whole text from verses nine through 11 is sequential. Love, okay, lead to a pursuit of what really matters or excellence, all right, which leads to integrity, all right, which will then lead to good works being produced in our lives, which leads to the glory of Christ, all right? So, so that's how this works. So love is the foundation of Christian living. Now, I want to give you a definition of biblical love real quick because biblical love isn't an ooey-gooey feeling, okay? Biblical love is discerning, all right? It's, it's a service renders to others who are in need, um, even if that means sacrifice. It's not an emotion. It's a duty. It's an act of selfless sacrifice on behalf of someone else. And our biblical love grows okay, as we rely and learn on God's word, okay, to teach us and guide us. I, I got to experience this this week firsthand. I told y'all that uh, last week maybe work isn't the funnest time right now, to be honest with you. Um, and then you add into that, I, 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 I've got a colleague there at work, to be honest with you, that just rubs me the wrong way, all right? I don't know if y'all ever experienced that or anything like that. And so I was really, and I was having to have a meeting with him this week, and I was really praying about it, and I was trying to understand what to do. And um, at night, before I go to bed, I have this little, uh, it's a little blue book. It was written by um, Ken Boa, and it's called, um, I think, um, A Guide to Renewal. And basically, it breaks down scripture, and it says, here's, here's, God, here's some God, two scripture verses on God attributes, two scripture verses on what God's work has done, a couple scripture verses on, like, you know, my relationship towards God, the character I want to to, to, to grow and then my relationship with other people. And it has, it's broken out for many days and each day is like that. And I try to read that before I go to bed so that way just God's scripture is in my mind before I lay down, okay? Um, and I remember though, I got to, like, last week I got to this point where it says my relationship with others and it was talking about love. And it dawned on me, okay, that I wasn't truly loving those people at work the way I should. In fact, to be honest with you, I didn't even really care about them. I just wanted to do my job, they do their job, they leave me alone, I leave them alone, and we go on there. And what I found out was, and all these problems that I was having with some of these people who I wasn't getting along with, God was giving me opportunities to show them his love. And to be honest with you, that's not something I could do myself. That's something I had to turn that over to God and rely on him. That's what Paul's talking about. He wants our love to abound. He wants it to grow in biblical knowledge so that it's discerning, so that we have wisdom so that we understand what really matters. So we pursue those things that are really excellent. So that love that, that, that has that deep knowledge of God's word, all right, allow us to be discerning so we understand what really matters, all right? Verse 10, for I want you to understand what really matters. So when a Christian's life is literally dominated by the love of God, there will be a corresponding desire to seek and live pure lives. Why? Because true love controlled by this deep knowledge of God's word is gonna show us those things that really matter. There's a lot of things in this life we can pursue that don't matter and God's word's gonna show, show us what really matters. So that's number two, the focus of what really matters. Number three, integrity, and this is verse 10b, that you may pursue blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. 
So we're to love so that we can pursue what really matters, that's excellence, in order for the purpose of being a person of integrity. And that's pure and blameless. And all these things are sequential. Love controlled by biblical truth and practical insight leads to the pursuit of what really matters, excellence, which generates personal and relational integrity. So when, that, when it says right here, live lives until um, pure and blameless lives, pure is personal integrity. That's your character. That's what you do when no one else is around. So when no one else is around, what you listen to, what you look at, what you do, what you say is blameless. It's pure. It's, 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 it's a personal integrity. Then the word blameless there, that's actually a relational integrity. That, that's how I relate with other people so I'm not causing anyone else to stumble. I'm living a life in a way that is helping build other people up, not tear them down. All right? So here we go. If you're going to have integrity, all right, personally and relationally, so that you do not compromise in this world and you stand against it, okay, we've got to make sure we know what's going on. And I want to spend a little time right now explaining how the world sucks you and I in. Because compromise can be so subtle. And I didn't plan it this way, but um, there's five steps. <laughs> it's been like, we've been doing a lot of fights like that. So this is how the world conforms us, and this is what we want to stand against, and this is why it's so important what Paul's talking about in verse 10 here about integrity, because this helps us not do it. It's interesting. So I had just finished up a study in the adult fellowship I, um, I uh, teach, and we had done First John, and we spent time in First John, and we came to a, a, a phenomenal passage and, uh, where, where, where John says, God is love. It was a profound statement. And so we paused and we stopped there and we, under, we started walking through a, kind of the theology of love. And what I told the class was, as I was doing some research there, I wanted to understand, well, well what does the world say about love and, and, and how does the world try to, try to conform us to its, to its way, its definition of love? And what I found out, and this was pretty interesting, what, what, what I sought out to find is how much information hits our eyes and ears per day? I, I, I'm a tech guy, I work in technology, I have my whole life, and I thought that was fascinating. Well, behavioral scientists have said this, 34 gigabytes of information hits your eyes and your ears every single day. 34 gigabytes. Now, let me ask you this, and you don't have to answer this out loud. How much of that 34 gigabytes do you think is God honoring? All those 34 gigabytes are trying to tell you what you need to do, trying to mold you. What's interesting is they even broke it down and they said, the average person has anywhere between six and 12,000 thoughts a day. Some people, they say, have up to 20,000. Now, how they measure that stuff, I don't know. All right, it's too, 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 too smart for me. But out of those six to 12 or 20,000 thoughts a day, 80% of them are negative. What's interesting is the next day, 90% are the same 80% negative thoughts that you had the day before, which are being fueled by the 34 gigabytes of information that is being pushed to your eyes and your ears every single day. So that's what you're up against. And this is what the world's gonna do. First step and how it's gonna conform us, try to conform us is this, accommodation. Now you may say, what is accommodation? Well, we just end up tolerating it. You know, we, we tolerate the world's sin and wickedness. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, well you, we stop being shocked by it. it. No longer shocks us. It's just, just, just no longer shocks us. That's step one, accommodation. The second step is we legitimize it. How? Well, we finally accept it as normal. First step is accommodation. We, 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 just, we just no longer shocks us anymore. The second step, we legitimize it. Okay, it, it, it's just normal. That's, that's, just the way, that's just the way life is or something like that. The third step is assimilation. And this is where we're getting really dangerous. And this is where things are, are, are we as Christians are real in danger. And that's when we start to cooperate with these wrong values because we stopped talking about it completely. First, we're no longer shocked by it, all right? Second one, we just say, well, that's just normal. That's just the way things happen. And third, we don't even discuss it anymore. We don't even talk about it anymore. It's just, it's just off, 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 off the thing. Fourth is participation. And that's when we go out and buy one. And you say, well, what, well no, okay, what, what do you mean by that, all right? And that's personal involvement, okay? We may no longer be shocked by it. We may, know, we may think it's normal in society. We may sit there and not even talk about it. But this right here is, okay, and I told you all this wouldn't be easy, okay? This is where we go out to the movies and we watch it. 
or we turn on the television program and we watch it, or we read books about it, or whatever, we have now started to participate in it. You see how subtle that is? And then the fifth vital step is identification. And this is where the worldly values are so fused with our values, you can't tell us the difference between a Christian or the world because they look just the same, all right? And the world can be so subtle. Compromise is so subtle and it takes us in before we even realize what happens. Now, we don't want to be swallowed up in this world, so we've got to deal with what? Integrity. And that's what Paul's saying back in verse 10. You want to make sure your life is genuine. You want to make sure love is genuine. You want to make sure you're pursuing what is right. You want to make sure that you have that personal integrity and that relational integrity. Now, the question is, how are we going to insulate ourselves against the world and its schemes? 34 gigabytes. Every day in, day out. Who knows what it'll be if you have kids or grandkids and they're in their 20s or 30s or something like that. Well, here it is. I'm gonna tell us. How we insulate ourselves and how we protect ourselves is right here by having a dominating biblical love controlled by the word of God, which is able to pursue what is excellent and maintains that personal and relational integrity that will not compromise. Do you see that? You can't have the integrity, all right, if you're not pursuing what is right. And you can't pursue what is right, all right, if you don't have the biblical knowledge that's giving you the wisdom to do that, and you can't do that if you're not loving the right way. Do you see how that works? And next one is how, how long are we supposed to love like that? And verse 10 says until Christ, Christ comes back, all right? So I'm gonna say that one more time. How we insulate ourselves, how we protect ourselves from what's going on but Paul is, part of what Paul is praying to these Philippian Christians in verses nine through 11, in the difficulties and the challenges that they were having in, that, in, 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 in Philippi, that Roman colony, okay, is this. Have a dominating biblical love controlled by the word of God, which is able to pursue what is excellent and maintains a personal integrity, which will not compromise, right? That's his prayer. That's what we should do. All right, verse 11. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. So love produces excellence. Excellence produces integrity. And integrity through the work of the Holy Spirit will also always produce good works that bring honor and glory to God. Okay? So, real quick. Love controlled by biblical truth and practical insight leads to the pursuit of what really matters, excellence, which generates personal and relational integrity that will always produce good works that glorify Christ. It's, it's, it's interesting because um, how quickly we can get off the rails and how quickly we get, we, get, we get pulled into different areas of our desires or things that actually might be quote unquote kind of good, but then they take our our, our focus off of God, all right? I remember when I was um, younger, um, one thing that kind of, um, you know, I, 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 I put my faith and trust in Christ when I was eight years old, and I, um, I can remember one thing that scared me, okay, about heaven was I thought, I thought heaven was gonna be a one endless choir concert, okay? Now, why did that scare me? Because I can't sing, okay? I, I remember my first job was at Dell Computers, right out of graduate school in Austin. And I remember I was in an office and we're singing happy birthday to a lady. And after we finished singing it, the lady next to me said, oh, I didn't know you were tone deaf. Well, I didn't know I was tone deaf either. You know what I mean? Until, until, until she, 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 she told me that. So I can remember, I remember sitting there, you know, for so long in my early life as a Christian thinking, oh my goodness, we're gonna be wearing robes and all we're gonna do is be singing. But then as I grew, okay, in my love and in biblical knowledge, and you start learning about God and his love for us, you learn that God is what? He's infinitely perfect in all his attributes. He, that means he's infinitely perfect in his creativity. And he's infinitely perfect in his power and his might and everything that he can do. And, and, and what he has in store for us, no mind can think of the goodness that he has. All right? So when, 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 when that, that was one way my wrong thinking, you know, kind of maybe... Would, would get me off if I didn't deal with that. And if we look in all of our lives, 
We probably all have things that are that way, all right? So let me ask you this, all right? How's your joy? How's your joy right now in your heart? Are you growing? Now you may say, well, you know, you, Russell, you gave us five things that the Holy Spirit uses to produce joy. Then you gave us five things that, 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 that our enemy is gonna try to take it away. And now you gave us five things that are essential for Christian growth. I don't even know where to begin. All right? And I wanted to make this very practical, so I'm gonna tell you where to begin, all right? It's all produced by whom? Christ. The Holy Spirit, God. Okay, and so you begin by dealing with the sin that's in your life, confessing it to the Lord, and yielding to the Spirit of God and letting the Spirit to produce joy and growth in your life, all right? Let me tell you something. The fact that we all were chosen before the foundations of the, of the world, before they were set up to be saved, Okay, the fact that we were given such glories in life of Christ, the fact that we've been given the privilege, access to God at any time through prayer, not only for ourselves, but other people, the fact that God has filled our life with so many blessings should cause us to be what? Constantly filled with what? With joy. And here comes the tough pill to swallow. If you're sitting here and you don't have joy in your life, don't blame your circumstances. Because no Christian should live without joy. If you don't have it, then you gotta take it back to where the problem really lies. And that's with me in my heart or you in your heart, and that's not being obedient and trusting God. All right? So this church should be the most joyful church in the world. Why? Because we've been so greatly blessed. We should have a joy that the Holy Spirit produces that, that, that helps us stand strong in difficult times so that when people on the outside look in, they sit there and go, I want that. You know, not because I've got my retirement figured out, not because I've got this figured out, you know, not because I've done this or this or this. No, what? Because of our trust and our faith in Christ that he's gonna produce that work, that we have that love that's growing from that deep knowledge of God's word that'll help us pursue what is right Okay, with those things that are excellent, what really matters so that it produces integrity in us so that the Holy Spirit will use that to produce good works that glorify Christ. So this is how you begin. Ask the Spirit of God for help. Cultivate, help asking to help cultivate a joy in your heart today. Not, you know, don't wait till tomorrow, do it today. Be on the guard against those things that steal your joy and let God's love grow in you. Spend time in God's word. Understand what he's seeing, because that will give us that insight. That'll give us that wisdom, all right, to understand what really matters, okay? And then the Holy Spirit will use that always, always to produce good works in our lives. And that will always bring glory to God, okay? I'm gonna shut down a little early today because I want us to uh, spend some time in prayer for, for two things, all right? In just a second, I'm gonna call the, 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 the worship band to come back up here. And uh, what we'll do is uh, we will pray for Uvalde, okay? And then also for, for, for Memorial Day. I think it's important to, important to do that. Um, difficult times, y'all. Hard times. And we wanna make sure that our focus is where it needs to be. All right, on God. So if I could call the band back up here, I will uh, go over to my designated spot and we will, uh, we will pray, all right? Father, um, in the best way we know how in the full of humility, we come before you and um, we hurt. Uh, we lift up to you the, the hurt, the pain, lives that are drastically changed by this tragic, horrible, evil thing that happened in Uvalde. And we ask God that in some way, somehow, 
that doesn't make sense to us, God, that you will bring a peace there and a peace that's based on your justice and a peace that will allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to be spoken so people would hear and put their faith, trust in you and be saved. It's a work that only you can do, God. And we ask for help. We also wanna thank you, God, for all those uh, men and women who have died defending this country. Thank you that we set aside a day aside to remember them. Help us never to forget the sacrifice, God. And God, and I ask as we go throughout this week, the rest of this day and this coming week, there will be times in our own lives, God, that are gonna be hard, that we wish we weren't in. And I ask God that our focus wouldn't be on our circumstances, but it would be on you and your goodness and that you would help to cultivate and grow that joy that can only come from your Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can love the right way. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and join us as we sing for joy to the King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the
Thank you for sending your son to choose to die on the cross that we might be able to find our joy and our salvation in you, Lord. Thank you for this reminder that the focus is not on ourselves, not on the things that are going around us, but planning and staying firm in your word that we might find the joy to spread to those around so that people might ask, who do you know that I need to know? Thank you for this gift. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Hello, Stonebriar family. I'm Susan Zeeby from Missional Living. A great part of being in our church family is having fun together. So here are a few ways that you can make friends and celebrate God's gift of joy. First up, in case you haven't heard, we have gatherings for senior adults every Tuesday morning from 10 to noon. If you're age 60 and above, come and join the fun. We've got games, snacks, and chat on the first and third Tuesdays and card writing, coffee and cake on the second and third, all in room B156. There's no need to sign up. Just come to the first floor of Building B for a great time with friends. Speaking of a great time with friends, those with special needs and their families are invited to our gift ministries evenings at the water park. On June 12th, July 10th, and July 31st, we'll have private access to the Frisco Athletic Center to swim and play. Kids, teens, and adults with special needs and their families are all welcome and tickets are discounted to only $9 per person. Find all the details and purchase your tickets in advance on our website. And finally, don't forget, tonight is our Memorial Day celebration with the Stonebriar Wind Symphony. Join us for patriotic tunes and American classics at Red, White, and Blue tonight at five o'clock in the Worship Center. Admission is free, so bring your friends and family and be sure to stick around after the concert for cool treats and lawn games. Find details and more summer fun for all ages at stonebriar.org slash events. Good morning, good morning church family. How are y'all today? Uh, glad you're here with us. Um, if you're here with us uh, for the first time or if you're a longtime uh, member here, welcome. Welcome. Uh, Russell, thanks. A great message this morning. Worship team, uh, always great. And uh, the AV team, always doing great. There's so much that goes into worship when we worship uh, the King of Kings, just like we sang. Uh, there's so much that goes into that. So we're, we're grateful that we can have such a great uh, team to come together and worship together. So uh, if you're here worshiping, if you're worshiping online, welcome. Uh, there's so much going on at Stonebriar these days. Uh, community is our middle name. So um, really there's lots of stuff, there's lots of ways to get involved as uh, Sue was, was talking about in the video. You can go on to our church website, stonebriar.org, and uh, I think you can type in a keyword for whatever you're looking for and find it here at Stonebriar. So if you're a guest with us, uh, you can scan the QR code. Uh, you can also, if you're a guest with us watching online, obviously you can go online and do that. Uh, but we're grateful for, here, for you today. Uh, you can also, there's lots of ways to get involved. One of the ways uh, is, like I said, online and also giving. Uh, there's lots of ways to give here at Stonebriar of your time, of your resources. Um, if you want to give online, you can text to give. Uh, you can also give in these big boxes in the back. Uh, it's the grays, the silver boxes, not the black. I think the other things are trash cans, so don't, don't do that. Um, anyway, we're, we're grateful that you're here today. Uh, lots of ways to get involved. So we, again, want to emphasize that. Get involved here at Stonebriar. If it, especially if you're new to Stonebriar, uh, there's lots of ways, lots of things going on. So uh, it's important that you connect. I think we'll have somebody back here in this uh, connection corner. It's Cheryl back there. Hi, Cheryl. Um, and then if you need some prayers, we are prayer warriors here at Stonebriar. We have so many um, so many people that can come together and pray for you. Um, and I think we'll have some folks down here, down front to pray. But uh, speaking of prayer, I wanna do that now. Um, you know, we celebrate Memorial Day. 
and what a cool parallel it is that people that are qualified, people that are qualified to go before us and fight for our freedom, people that lay down their life uh, so that we can have the freedom that we all enjoy and that we can have the cookouts and stuff like that. Um, but isn't that cool? A qualified person go in before us to lay down their life for our freedom. So we're grateful for all the people that have served in our armed forces uh, to do that. We do that. Uh, and then we can also pray to the one who has gone before us to give us those people, but certainly has been qualified. He is qualified to go before and lay down his life for our freedom. So let me pray for us. Father, we come to you very grateful, so grateful that um, we don't have to be under our circumstances. All of us come, uh, we're, we're coming from different, different areas in our life that uh, sometimes they overwhelm us. Uh, the headlines of the day, the headlines in our own life, they can overwhelm us easily. Those circumstances, it's easy to be uh, under those circumstances, but um, as Russell was uh, talking about in Philippians, it's, it's really that joy um, that when we realize that you are the one, you are the one that we can focus on because you're in control. In your word, it says you are before all things and in you, all things hold together. So we're grateful for that. And so we pray to you, uh, Lord, just help us not be focused on those things, but give us that true joy. Let that be the, the strength that we walk in daily. So God, I pray for each one here that whatever we're, whatever we're going through in our lives, whatever we have that uh, loved ones are going through, people that we know, Lord, I pray that we would focus on you. You would encourage us. You would confirm yourself to us. And I pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Before you go, we'd love to connect with you. Check out stonebriar.org slash welcome to explore what our church has to offer, both online and in person, or visit stonebriar.org slash guest to fill out a guest card so we can reach out and help you get started. We'd love to welcome you to our church family, so we hope to hear from you soon. Have a great week.